A new discovery buried beneath the soils of rural England now forces a profound question. Who was making fire in England 400,000 years ago? At East Farm Barnum in Suffolk, archaeologists have uncovered the earliest secure evidence anywhere in the world for deliberate fire-making using pyrite. Not just fire use, not just tending embers from a natural blaze, but repeated, localized combustion consistent with humans that could create and wield fire on command. This means that early humans had an advanced knowledge of mineralogy, in addition to their previously discovered arboreal knowledge and engineering skills. This was not a cave hearth protected from the elements, but an open-air landscape, a place where fire could only be maintained if it was actively controlled and repeatedly relit. The implications of this discovery extend far beyond England. They strike at the heart of who lived in Europe during the Middle Pleistocene and how cognitively and technologically sophisticated they really were. The Barnum site dates to marine isotope stage 11, around 427,000 to 415,000 years ago, one of the warmest interglacials of the Middle Pleistocene. England at this time was not a cold, marginal frontier, but a temperate mosaic of grassland, woodland, ponds and streams. The site itself lay in a shallow basin formed by earlier glacial action, later infilled by interglacial sediments. Crucially, within this basin, archaeologists identified a buried land surface, a paleosol, preserving a snapshot of repeated human activity. It is on this paleosol that the story changes. Here, researchers found a discrete patch of reddened clay sediment, surrounded by a dense concentration of stone tools. More than three quarters of the artifacts in this area show clear signs of heating, cracked flint, crazed surfaces and shattered hand axes. These were not random burn marks scattered by wildfire. They were tightly localised, spatially coherent and clearly associated with human tools. The sediment itself tells an even more compelling story. Micromorphological analysis revealed the formation of hematite, an iron oxide created when iron-rich soils are heated. The reddening was preserved in place, not washed in or smeared by later processes. This was not natural oxidation. It was heat used in a hearth that would have been within a man-made shelter. Fire leaves many signatures, but one of the most telling is repetition. Wildfires burn once and move on. Human fires return to the same spot over and over. At Barnum, environmental magnetism revealed the presence of fine-grained magnetic minerals formed through heating. Minerals that accumulated not from a single blaze, but from multiple short-duration heating events. Experimental comparisons showed that the sediment's magnetic signature most closely matched scenarios involving repeated fires, consistent with human behavior rather than natural combustion. Chemical analysis reinforced this conclusion. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, molecular residues of burning, revealed a pattern unlike regional wildfires. The reddened sediment contained a higher proportion of heavy compounds that form at higher temperatures and tend to remain close to the fire source. Crucially, their distribution was decoupled from the regional fire regime recorded in nearby sediments. In plain terms, this fire was local, intentional and independent. Sophisticated infrared spectroscopy pushed the evidence even further. Some sediment samples showed signs of having been heated beyond 750 degrees Celsius, temperatures far higher than most natural grass or woodland fires achieve in soil. Such temperatures imply focused combustion, likely involving managed fuel and repeated ignition. Together, these independent lines of evidence converge on a single conclusion. This was a maintained hearth, used repeatedly by humans who understood fire and controlled it with precision. If the hearth itself was not enough, Barnum offers something even more extraordinary, a literal smoking gun. Embedded within the paleosol were two fragments of iron pyrite, also known as fool's gold, a mineral used in later prehistory as a fire-making tool. Strike pyrite against flint and sparks fly. This is one of the oldest known fire-making technologies documented ethnographically and archaeologically across Eurasia. Here is the crucial detail. Pyrite is geologically rare in the Barnum region. Extensive surveys of over 120,000 stone clasts from local Pleistocene deposits found not a single piece of pyrite. 
The nearest documented sources lie many miles away, buried deep within the chalk bedrock. In other words, the pyrite at Barnum did not end up there by chance. It was carried by human hands. The pyrite fragments were found in close association with heated flint and the hearth area itself. Their surfaces show oxidation consistent with prolonged exposure above ground, exactly what would be expected if they were curated tools used repeatedly, carried from place to place, and eventually discarded. This is not opportunistic fire use. This is a fire-making kit. With these fragments, England becomes the earliest site on Earth where humans certainly made fire deliberately, rather than merely maintaining it once acquired. But who were these fire-makers? This is where the story becomes truly disruptive. At 400,000 years ago, England was not inhabited by classic Neanderthals as most people imagine them. The fossil record tells a more complex story. This period sits in the murky evolutionary zone between Homo heidelbergensis, early Neanderthals, and other archaic populations that do not fit neatly into later categories. Across Europe at this time, we find a constellation of fossils. Atapuecas, Cima de los Huesos Hominins in Spain, Aragoman in southern France, Petrolona in Greece, and Steinheim in Germany. These individuals show a mixture of traits, some foreshadowing Neanderthals, others more primitive. They are often labelled pre-Neanderthals, but this term hides as much as it reveals. What matters is this. These populations already had large brains approaching modern human ranges, robust bodies adapted to temperate climates, and sophisticated stone tool traditions. The hand axes at Barnum belong to a distinct Aculean tradition, suggesting cultural continuity with earlier European populations rather than sudden replacement. If these people could make fire at will, then many long-held assumptions collapse. Fire-making requires planning, foresight, knowledge of materials, and social transmission of skills. It implies an understanding of cause and effect, the ability to curate tools across landscapes, and the capacity to organize daily life around a stable domestic focus. These are not marginal abilities. They are foundational to human social life. At Terra Amata, a middle Pleistocene site overlooking the ancient shoreline on the French Riviera, archaeologists uncovered evidence that fundamentally altered our understanding of early human behavior. Dated to roughly 400,000 years ago, Terra Amata preserves some of the clearest early signals of controlled fire use in Europe, emerging at precisely the same time as the hominins known from nearby Arago Cave. Together, these sites force a reconsideration of who was capable of managing fire and how deeply rooted this ability was in pre-Neanderthal populations. Terra Amata is exceptional because it preserves an open-air living surface rather than a cave assemblage. Unlike caves which naturally trap ash and charcoal, open-air sites only preserve evidence of fire if combustion was frequent, spatially organized, and repeatedly maintained. At Terra Amata, excavations reveal discrete hearth-like features associated with stone tools, faunal remains, and constructed living surfaces. These features were not randomly scattered traces of burning. They appeared in structured contexts, suggesting repeated human activity rather than accidental wildfire intrusion. The sediments at Terra Amata include reddened areas consistent with heating, clusters of thermally altered stones, and concentrations of charcoal interpreted as hearth remains. Crucially, these fire features recur across multiple occupation surfaces, indicating that fire was not a rare or opportunistic phenomenon. Instead, it appears to have been an integral part of daily life. The spatial organization of the site, including zones interpreted as shelters or windbreaks, further supports the idea that fire was being used deliberately within domestic settings rather than passively exploited from natural sources. This matters because at around 400,000 years ago, southern France was inhabited not by classic Neanderthals, but by a population often described as pre-Neanderthal or Homo heidelbergensis sensu lato. These were the same populations represented by the famous Arago fossils from Tauteville, located less than 125 miles away. The temporal and geographic proximity between Terra Amata and Arago makes it extremely unlikely that fire use at the former 
was an isolated cultural anomaly. Instead, it reflects a regional behavioral pattern shared by these middle Pleistocene Europeans. The Arago hominins themselves provide important context. Fossils from Arago Cave, particularly Arago 21, show a combination of robust cranial features, large brow ridges, and expanding brain size, but lack the full suite of derived Neanderthal traits. These individuals occupied a Mediterranean temperate ecotone, exploiting large game and maintaining long-term occupations of the landscape. Their anatomy suggests cold tolerance, strength and endurance, while their archaeological associations indicate advanced Aculean tool traditions. What Terra Amata adds to this picture is behavioral resolution. Fire use bridges the gap between anatomy and cognition. Managing fire requires planning, fuel selection, spatial awareness, and social coordination. Fires must be protected from wind, fed regularly, and placed in safe locations relative to sleeping and working areas. The repeated appearance of fire features at Terra Amata implies that these hominins were not merely opportunistic users of flame, but understood combustion as a controllable process. Importantly, Terra Amata is not alone. It sits within a broader European pattern of fire use emerging during marine isotope stage 11. Sites such as Beaches Pit in England, Menes Dragon in Brittany, and La Cancelladeta in Spain all show evidence of burning around the same period. This convergence strongly suggests that fire control was becoming widespread among European populations rather than appearing suddenly or independently in isolated locations. Recent work has shown that this pattern is best explained by habitual fire maintenance rather than sporadic wildfire exploitation. The significance of this becomes clearer when contrasted with earlier periods. Although claims of fire use exist at sites older than one million years, most are ambiguous and lack clear evidence of repeated localized heating. By contrast, sites such as Terra Amata show a qualitative shift. Fire becomes spatially anchored, recurrent, and integrated into living spaces. This shift coincides with increases in brain size, more complex hunting strategies, and greater ecological flexibility. In this light, Terra Amata is not merely an early fire site. It is evidence that pre-Neanderthal Europeans were already living in a fundamentally human way. They organized space, exploited fire, and structured social life around shared domestic activities. The Arago hominins were not standing on the threshold of humanity. They were already inside it. By the time classic Neanderthals emerged, fire was not a new invention. It was an inherited tradition. Terra Amata shows us that the roots of this tradition stretch back at least 400,000 years to populations whose sophistication has too often been underestimated. The new evidence suggests that the roots of Neanderthal behavior run deeper than previously believed. Firemaking did not suddenly appear with classic Neanderthals in the late Pleistocene. It was already present hundreds of thousands of years earlier among populations ancestral to Neanderthals and possibly to Denisovans and modern humans as well. This challenges the idea that Neanderthal cognition lagged behind that of Homo sapiens. Instead, it points to a shared technological and behavioral inheritance across middle Pleistocene populations. Firemaking may have been part of a broader behavioral revolution unfolding between 500,000 and 300,000 years ago, a period that also saw advances in woodworking, hunting technology, and eventually hafting adhesives. Fire also reshapes social life. It creates light after dark, warmth in cooler seasons, and a focal point for communication and cooperation. Ethnographic studies of modern hunter-gatherers show that firelight fosters storytelling, teaching, and social bonding. If similar dynamics existed in England, then these pre-Neanderthal populations were not just surviving, they were living socially complex lives. So who was really making fire in England 400,000 years ago? The answer refuses to fit into our tidy labels. It was not fully formed Neanderthals as traditionally imagined. It was a population of middle Pleistocene Europeans, descendants of earlier Aculean hominins, who already possessed the cognitive and technological foundations of later humanity. This new evidence does not merely push back the date of firemaking. It forces us to confront a deeper truth. 
the behavioral gap between archaic humans and ourselves has been dramatically overstated. Fire, long seen as the dividing line between primitive and advanced humanity, was already mastered by people whose names we still argue about. In the soils of Suffolk, the embers of that realization still glow. Thanks for watching.